As an archaeologist, I've spent about the last 20 years of my life living on mountaintops that look like this. Only in the summer, though. The rest of the time I'm here, more or less teaching uh, to everyone in this room. And I want to share some insights from that work uh, that I've been doing. My research primarily deals with the origins and archaeological evidence of early nomadic societies. Uh, these are societies that rely largely on, nomad, uh, on pastoral herds, so domesticated animals, as their way of life. But they also grew into powerful uh, political entities. Think Mongols, but in this case, without all the burning and pillaging. But before I get to information and sort of how they fit into our narrative of civilization, I want to share with you an interesting um, insight that I gained from this particular yurt that you see here on the mountainside. That's this sort of mobile home of nomadic populations that they can pick up seasonally and move around. And what's interesting about contemporary herders in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, other parts of Central Asia where I work, is that um, when you arrive at their sort of domicile, once you get past the barking dogs, they're extremely hospitable, and they almost always invite you in. So we sit there, we drink tea, we have uh, sweet snacks or various kinds of uh, food. And one of the things I noticed amidst the carpets and the other adornments inside their yurt are images that look like this. Now you might say, what is an individual who spends all of their time herding sheep, goat, and cow, cows, and, and horses living in a triple landlocked country doing with a plaque or a banner with something like this. And I kind of didn't pay attention to it initially as I kind of worked and just constantly would see these things. And then I kind of one moment realized that it was part of our unique ability to envision a world outside of our material reality that may very well be at the foundation of, our, of the origins of our civilization. Now you might say, wow, that's a pretty big leap. What I'm here to talk to you tonight about is the notion of utopia and the idea that we can envision a world, a perfect world, possibly a world that doesn't even exist, but that that vision of a utopia has with it a downside. And that's what I call the utopian paradox. Now, what's interesting is that almost all humans in the human, everyone in the human species, which by that I mean basically you, some of you have a bit of Neanderthal in you, uh, can do this. And so as part of the presentation tonight, I want you to close your eyes. Everyone, close your eyes. And imagine that place, situated in land, you know, in its landscape, situate the smells, the temperature, the food. What is that perfect utopian world? What does it look like? What are the politics like? What are the people like? Okay, don't open your eyes. I have a job, especially for the millennials in the room. I want you to take that same space and imagine it in utter disarray. I want you to imagine it in utter misery and dysfunction. Is it easy for you to do? I think it was, now you can go ahead and open your eyes. I am gonna ask you to come back to that image at the end, so please remember what you thought of. If you thought of that tropical island, great, I just kind of gave you a feed for that. But you, some of you might have thought something like this. When I Google searched utopia, I was looking for kind of good images to show you about what the world thinks of utopia. A lot of them came up with this kind of cybernetic, techno-urban world, right? A lot of what we see in sci-fi. And it's a world structured around a couple of major phenomena, major kind of principles. One is urbanism itself, for which we know there's some good things. We know that urbanism provides high-density connectivity. It allows for innovation in terms of populations being closely knit with one another. But we also see fossil fuels, right, as part of this. Or we need energy to run these kinds of cities. So it's either fossil fuels, or if in the, in the best of all worlds, it's this kind of, you know, ethereal, renewable energy, something that we aspire toward. We also think of technology, and of course the robot here is why I chose this image. AI, things that allow us to sort of augment and extend our technological realm, make us live in environments where it's freezing outside and warm inside, right? These are the elements of our, of our current utopia and arguably are part of our future utopia and essentially run our civilization, at least from, from a contemporary and modern perspective. But this isn't the first time that we've done this. In fact, if we back up 30,000 years ago and we reimagine a place like Chauvet Cave in France, this is a Paleolithic cave 
where individuals who, whose technology was little more than a stone chopper went in from the outside, sort of the wild world, into this cave, lit fires, and drew a pantheon of animals. Now, we don't 100% understand what these animals meant. They might have been religious connotations. They may have had uh, just simply an animals they wanted to eat. Maybe they were, they were totems. There's lots of ways to explain what the animals meant. But one thing is, I think, for sure. This was a world that they valued, and this was a vision that they were able to instantiate on the walls of this cave without actually having all these animals right in front of them. Again, this creative ability that we uniquely have as, as humans. Fast forward a couple tens of thousands of years, and here we are at roughly the, the dawn of the Neolithic era. Hunter-gatherers living in central Turkey were able to amass a large population, upwards of 500 people, we think, to build one of the first religious temples known in the archaeological record. Here again, we see an enacted vision, in this case architecturally built, where individual stele were carved with animals, and they constructed a, a religious center for them to execute their beliefs. We can see this in very much the same frame as other religious beliefs and other religious paradises, right? We have this sort of notion of a religious paradise or a religious utopia. And I think we can go far beyond some of our current organized religions to understand that this component of utopia was a major building block in our progress towards uh, construction and, and change in our civilization. Fast forward yet, yet a few more millennia, and here we are at the first known city in the world. Uruk, located in present-day Iraq. Uruk is about 5,000 years ago, 5,000 years old, and it was built around the principles of monumental ceremonial architecture. Dense occupation, upwards of thousands of people living in what we could today call a city. And I think it's at this point that we really begin to tangibly feel the, the, the tension between the utopian and dystopian reality. It's at this point that in order to build those monumental centers, it wasn't just a group of people getting together and saying, hey, we want to make a temple. This was already a power structure. We see cities as a center for not only the growth of, of, cent of architectural uh, splendor, but of a separation of class and wealth. We see fo some folks having to work in the fields while other folks are enjoying their life in the, in the temples and in the citadels. This is the beginning, I think, of, of some serious levels of class differentiation. And again, our capacity to start to recognize the paradox in this notion of a utopian world that we constantly are recreating and recreating. At the same time, however, this wasn't the only model of civilization. And this is where I want to come back to my own research in the mountains of Kazakhstan. This is an individual who happened to ride up alongside our excavations. You can see our shovels just along the ground there. And talking to him, um, we were, he was asked, asking everyone in, in the camp, uh, had we seen a cow, a baby cow? He had lost one of his herd animals. And he, I had asked him at the same time, I said, well, how far did you go to look for this animal? He had been riding for three days. Three days away from his home, away from his family, in order to find this one lost animal. Now, this is just sort of the side story, because the real story here is the creation of network. I later visited his family years later, because I met him and I knew he took his name and took his cell phone number. And I actually visited him in his own home village. And this home village was hundreds of miles away from where we were. The populations at the very same time that people were building cities in Uruk, these nomadic communities were generating networks. They were innovating horses, they were domesticating horses, they were trading in metals, they were creating what we ultimately come to learn is one of the most extensive trade networks in the world. And I'll show you an image of that in a second. But not only was their interactive sphere very sophisticated, they themselves created a different brand of civilization. It wasn't rooted in urbanism. It wasn't rooted in dense, heavy uh, population pressure. It was actually rooted in uh, a network that was relatively disarticulated, modular. If we fast forward through time, yet another couple thousand years, these very same nomads began to interact with larger empires on their fringe, Chinese, Persian, Greek empires. This is the time of Alexander the Great, the rise of the Han Empire, the Han Dynasty. And these po nomadic populations, who grew out of those earlier Bronze Age communities, started to reflect their wealth and prosperity and their own individuality. They draped their, their rulers in gold clothing, from head to toe, covered in gold. And it's at this point that we begin to see that that network starts to steer and veer towards a slightly more dystopian reality, one in, in my view. In one of these scenarios, we, we see huge herds of animals being traded back and forth between the Chinese and the steppe lands. 
And it's at this point that, we, again, we see a transition in the political structure of these nomadic communities towards greater and greater um, organization, yet at the same time, teetering towards this paradoxical uh, dystopic moment. Everything wasn't bad, however. Uh, here we see, for example, about a thousand years ago, the development, kind of the height of the Silk Road. This is that apocryphal uh, transitional highway that runs between China and Southwest Asia. And it's the, th this trade route that enabled these nomadic communities to gain access to even greater wealth and to participate in this sort of general model of civilization that we kind of come to understand as urban, technical, agricultural. And this is kind of the model of the, no, of, of the Mongols, right? This concept that nomads were constantly crashing in on the outer walls of cities. But in fact, that's only part of the story. Because if we look at some of the innovations that these nomadic communities actually built on their own, they started to transform their utopian view to conform to some of the ideas that they had seen with their competitors. What you're looking at is a video of a nomadic city. Now, you say, that doesn't make any sense. This is actually a city built by nomadic populations with all the trappings of lowland cities, towers, defensive walls, um, vast architecture, possibly even some agriculture. And this was built at 2,000 meters elevation. That's like 6,000 feet or more, high up in the mountains. And you see some of the structures behind you. The construction of this city seemed great at first. But of course, this was built in an environment where resources weren't available to sustain such a density. And it's at this point, about 200 years after the initial construction, that the city collapsed. Now, collapse isn't a new concept. But there's an interesting factor about collapse. You very rarely hear of societies that aren't urban, aren't agricultural, and aren't sort of technologically sort of hyper-advanced collapsing. Only under the pressure of you know, things like colonialism did we see some of these kinds of uh, scenarios. Most societies who are non-urban actually are quite adaptable and quite sustainable, much like those nomadic communities of the Bronze Age. So here on the right-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side, you see this desiccated irrigation system from Western China. This was a system instituted in order to grow crops in a place that, where no one should ever probably grow crops. Yet the use of technology here was, was meant to sort of mimic this agricultural model, right? This notion of this is how we get bigger, better, stronger, and more wealthy. Now, we don't have to think very far from our own world. On the right-hand side, you see a contemporary industrial crop field, in this case, corn. And you know, our integration of GMO corn and all these modifications to be able to grow more and more and more on less and less and less could be equated to some of these models, these sort of warning signs about the collapse and the pressure and the environmental pressure that some of these utopian visions uh, of, say, feeding the world or feeding ourselves may have. This is, again, that paradox that I'm talking about. What's interesting is that through time, if we take this as an aggregate, we seem to return and return and return to this problem of creating a utopian vision, attempting to actually to execute it, making a bunch of problems, and then re-envisioning a new utopia to fix it again. And again, that's really the heart of the paradox. I love this image on the left here from the Los Angeles Times Magazine, 1988. I know many of you weren't born, but that's OK. But what you can see here is kind of the vision of a lot of architects and designers about what the world would look like in 2013. I mean, that seems so far away. Now, we've all gone through 2013, and I can tell you that at least the cars don't look that way. Although, if you look at the most recent Toyota concept car, it actually looks almost exactly like that. But what we do see are some elements of this kind of coming true. On the right-hand panel, you see Shanghai today. In the foreground, you see the ancient vision of the city, right? This sort of traditional Chinese architecture. And in the back, you see Pudong, the new city. This sort of scream, you know, screaming high, to high buildings and this incredible mirrored light. This is our utopian world being repeated and re-envisioned re and repeated and re-envisioned over and over again with all those problems that come along with it, like overpopulation, pollution, resource stress. So what's next? We're using up our planet at an alarming rate. We are overpopulating at an alarming rate. And basically, this whole talk could have been an incredible doomsday tale. But there's, there's hope in, in sight. We've got an entire solar system that we can approach and destroy that in, in probably a couple hundred years, too. The problem with the Kepler system, which if, you, if some of you who know, these are planets that are, according to astronomers, uh, like our own. They have water-based systems, atmospheres, et cetera, that could potentially 
house humans. This is yet another example of our utopian vision uh, extending itself now to another planet. And you say, ah, oh, well, we're never going to be able to go to another planet. Oop. Not if you ask Elon Musk. Here's the plans for settling our population on Mars. Again, and again, this is a perspective, but SpaceX is launching rockets on a regular basis. We're spending a lot of our resources for, in a sense, a very indi individualized utopian notion that we can take our population, a water-based organism, and move it to a planet that is utterly dry and does not sustain, and it has no atmosphere. To me, the notion of building a city on Mars, which is basically what we're looking at here, is a vast turn towards a dystopian collapse. But we don't have to go to Mars. Remember that slide of the Maldives that we saw in the beginning? This is what the Maldives actually looks like. As a tourist, you arrive in the Maldives, you get shuttled onto a boat, and you immediately got to a beautiful utopian island where you have a little thatch hut off on, the, off on the atoll. The vast majority of Maldivians live on an island like this, with dense urban population in a place that should never have had a skyscraper built on it in the first place. This is an island made of coral remains, coral sand. There's no real soil on the Maldives. So the reality of the Maldives versus the utopian notion of the Maldives are two fundamentally different things. And that's not to speak of the impact. The impact of Male, the actual city of what, 250, 300,000 people, is trash. And what do you do with, a trash that, with trash on an island that you cannot dig down? Well, you move it to another island. And so this is the island some uh, 20 kilometers offshore of Male, where the trash is just piling up and burning and then floating off into sea. This is our current utopian dream. And that was what I think is really interesting about that image that we saw inside the yurt, is that a country like Male, or sorry, a country like the Maldives is going to, in less than 100 years, probably not exist due to the rising ocean levels. So how do we address this paradox? Well, if I had a direct one-line answer, I mean, I probably would be, you know, like the chancellor or something. <laughs> I don't, but I do have some insights from what we've learned or what we've seen today in some of the archaeological work that I've shown you. The first thing is that we have and will continue to regenerate utopian ideas. And we will use those ideas to recast and re-envision what our civilization is going to look like. The problem is, we're basically C plus students. Now, there's a silver lining here. If you're a millennial, it's like an A minus. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> the reason why we have this kind of perpetual failure, or let's say inability to reach that utopian notion, is that we're dependent upon a path dependency. So we're dependent upon a path that is fossil-fueled, technology-driven, and urban. Now, with the prospect that 70% of the world's population is going to be living in a city by 2050, we're not going to stop that train. But what I hope I've been able to show you is that there are alternative paths. There are alternative ways to approach this issue. And it means customizing our relationship between the environment and technology. It means, while at the same time exploring ideas and knowledge through global networks, it means implementing those and executing those plans at localized scales. And it's at that level that I want to end on this photograph of this young Indonesian girl who I met along the pathway walking to a, a hut in a village on the island of Lombok. She was collecting clay from her garden and from the alley alongside the road, uh, which was very specific. And she had very specific places in her yard where she collected that clay. And she was making little model of dollhouses. And you can see that off to her right-hand side, or I guess it's her left-hand side. The clay houses were kind of typical of anybody who makes toys. They looked very much, even to the, to the details on the corner of the roofs, just like the house that she grows up in. And so when I asked her, hey, what are you doing? What are you making? She said, I'm making my dream house, and I'm making my family. And it's at this point that I want to kind of end on a kind of positive note. We can fix our utopian paradox through a familiarizing process, through one of localizing our world in a sustainable place, and through an execution of technology and possibly even some urbanism, provided we pay attention to that local training, that sort of ability to translate through our generation after generation, not only the utopian success, but the, utopian, the dystopian failures. 
So remember I told you I was going to ask you to come back to your image. I need you to close your eyes again. I want you to reimagine that place, the one that you thought of earlier in the lecture. Has it changed at all? Have you revised your notion of what that utopia could look like? Are you worried now that maybe the utopia you thought of, in fact, is incredibly impossible or incredibly dystopic? Okay, you can open your eyes. If you have, then I guess I've done something tonight. Thank you.